I was seven years old. And you're one of those people in the trench? I was one of them with my mother. My mother kept my eyes closed because one time uh, a plane was on fire. So you see parachute, one, two, it's supposed to be more than that, and three. And that guy came over and because there was so much fire in the sky, the parachute caught on fire. So he was going like this down with the parachute on fire and my mother closed my eyes. We thought it's close, it's an it, 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 optical illusion. We thought it's gonna be on top of us, but it was a far away. And uh, I have pictures that uh, I got it from the real guys that was in airplanes. What, what, what happened in the sky? I mean, you should see, you know, pieces of the plane and swinging like this. And that was back, for me, was like a, three years watching this every single day. Was it three years? About three years, yeah, mm -hmm, of bombing. Uh, in order to destroy completely the refinery. So as soon as they destroyed the refinery, the war ended. When we get to the highway, we see some planes coming over. We say, oh, oh, we can't go. We're going to be bombing. Let's go back home. So we, by the time we get back home, the, the, the gravel, the, one of the planes would have been hit by the shrapnel from the explosion on the air and uh, what's going down. So that airplane, when it crashed, my dad said, we have to see maybe we can save some lives. So you pull over on the highway, go over there, and uh, I was after him. and. Uh, he grabbed three guys that was conscious out of the, he, he ripped the bomb bay door, they were ripped already. So he moved the bomb bay door, he dragged, took three guys out of there, and uh, he see that they're kind of unconscious and they have some wounds and stuff. He said, we can't get out of here because the Germans knew that we're here. So we have to get out of here. So you put three guys over there, he shoot the other guy, they were kind of almost probably dead. He, he taught them that time. And he said, uh, we gotta go. So we have to play a place to go picnic all the time, all those years. And do the woods, because there was woods all over the place surrounding this lake. So you put the thing in the car, big 1939, which I have another parade every year, almost. <laughs> and. Uh, it took me 36 years to smuggle the car and bring him here to restore it. And uh, he said, you stay here with them. Oh, but there was a little creek in the bushes. And then I'm going to go there, see if I can rescue some more. If not, your uncle is going to come over and pick you guys up. So don't go nowhere. Now these guys are crazy because we can communicate. My dad can communicate with them. He didn't know what's going on. It's, gonna, it's a militia, they're gonna help him. They're gonna be something like that. They tell them to sit down and they sit down and between the bushes and trees. When they saw me, seven years old, sitting with them, I said, this guy is crazy, he's not gonna leave this little boy with us, he doesn't know us. So he trusts us. So that was a bound between thinking, my dad and them. So sitting with them over there, you know, they trying to kind of communicate with me. One guy um, put his hand over here and gave me a little pencil with the eraser on the end. It says made in USA, which I kept it for the rest of my life. It's in the museum. My mother brought it over. Another guy, I think he was an electrician or radio man, I put a, a, a little plier, cut a plier, the cut wires and stuff. But this guy said, you guys are crazy. So he put a hand over here, exactly in this pocket, right here. And get something out of there. It was like a candy bar or something. And, uh, and I hold it in my hand. And he said, come over here and send me over here. So he was sitting with his, his back against the tree. And then I sit with him and, uh, and says, you're talking to me. And he says, hey, you don't like it? Probably said that. No, I was holding. He says, this kid doesn't know what the heck is done. So he took the 
the, the, the candy bar and open it up, broke it up a piece and put it in my mouth. I found out that was my first taste of chocolate in my whole entire life. <laughs> So uh, in 1946, 47, 48, when the communists took over and the king, the king got out of the country, uh, one night came somebody knocking the door, you know, dark clothes and stuff like that, and says, uh, Are you any escorts here? I says, Yeah. My mother says, uh, Can you please uh, give me a room? says, uh, we have to, You have to come with us. So, uh, he went with those two guys and disappeared. And I heard that when you, something like that happened, they put him into a labor camp. Because that guy, in, in the communist country, you don't have to have a proof. You just have to tell something to a guy. And he said, oh, so he's been there because he's infidel for our country. So he was for one, one year and six months at the channel on the Black Sea there on the Danubian River, working over there like a slave. Uh, can recognize him. He was lost a lot of weight and sick. He came with a heart condition, uh, blood pressure, and, and a lot of other things that uh, he couldn't work. So the only thing he had to do, he had to be a driver on the trucks for construction to rebuild the capital from the bombing raids. And that's what he did. The life is so uh, c controlled. Every single minute of your life, somebody knows what you're doing. So that makes me think that uh, those guys, for me, the one I uh, got the chocolate, I call them guardian angels because they inspire me everything. So they support me, they support my conscience, they support everything, how to escape. In the late 60s, I uh, make a plan, the two guys, and then uh, we found out two more. So uh, we tried to escape, so we went to be trained because everybody has to be trained. Living in the woods, sleeping in the woods, not eating, not drinking, uh, crossing water that's icy water and stuff like that, swimming. And so we did that and then we went into the border and find out how, the, how to go from from Romania to Hungary or from to Slovakia or from Yugoslavia. And then uh, we went very close to it. Over there it's a piece of, of dirt that all the time goes, the tractor. And if you put your foot on there, you leave your footprint right there. You see somebody cross over here. So go right after you. Because it's, it's a patrol that goes up and down, 200 yards this way, then another patrol goes 200 yards. So there are tons of them, people watching every foot that you put across. So we heard, bing, 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 bing. I said, this is a firearm, this is a... So in the morning, you see the people they are trying to cross, they kill them. So that's the only thing I said to my parents when I said goodbye. I didn't know I'm not gonna see them again. I will be dead, crossing those two countries. Well, what's gonna happen to me, I don't know. But I took the risk in order to be dead, but not to suffer, to live for the rest of my life in that kind of regime. And the moment she buried him over there, you know, that thing then, then she came over and says, I'm on my way. As soon as she came, then the rest of them came over. But they have to go different countries. They can't come straight to the United States like my mother. So um, that's what I got them all back here. My brother, and my brother passed away last year, uh, 90. I came in 69 or 79, 10 years later, already had my own place. So I opened up my shop, Automotive, 
because I grew up in Italy and I'm part of the, in Romania and Italy they have a lot of Italian cars. I was a specialist in, 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 in working in the Italian cars. Yeah. So I opened up what they call uh, uh, reliable motors. First was the reliable fear, but then I changed it because people was making jokes with me. Just, it's not such a thing, reliable fear. <laughs> Fix it again, Tony. Fix it again, Tony. <laughs> so I opened up, then I started working on uh, a 1984 Fiat went down. So I started working on Renault and Alfa Romeo and some other stuff. It's all close to Mesa? It's in Costa Mesa, Placentia and Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I worked there until the age of 82. 40, 40, 40 years of, of, of business. In 1990, I started storing military vehicles. So I restored a lot of vehicles. I restored my dad's car and stuff like that. And uh, I was specialized in Jeeps because my dad during the war was not really left over, just whatever the Americans left over their the military vehicles to the Russians, American Jeeps. So I started my dad and I restoring Jeeps. So that was my little thing, they put the windshield down, no doors, no nothing, you drive that thing, just like a boat. So I said, my God, I, I, I mean, I was just crazy about those cars. So that's what I started doing. It. And by the time I retired, I retired from there, I disturbed 37 Jeeps.